Hello, I'm Herb Nadelhofer. This is a memoir. Farmers, corn, great-grandfather's farm, hazy memories. My mother and father, Harriet and Carlton Nadelhofer, brought me home to our dairy farm in March 1929, seven miles east of Naperville on 71st Street, a country gravel road with farms on all sides. It took me a couple of years to get on my feet and begin to explore this wonderland of ducks, turkeys, corn, cows, and manure. Carlton, my older brother, and I, cowboy and Indian, ranged over the farm and buildings, sometimes walking the ridge of the barn cupola to cupola. We were always wary of our dangerous and powerful dairy bulls and have a number of bull stories to tell like every farm kid does. We loved to help our dad by riding the workhorses when he was planting corn or cultivating. If we didn't have a horse to ride, we could always sneak up on our sleeping pigs and jump on their backs for a turbocharged gallop before we were thrown to the dirt. At least horses had manes to hang on to. Our five or six horses, 35 cows and heifers, were always in our pastures and around the barn, especially at milking time. Our 178-acre farm and our great-grandfather's 1875 timber frame barn was a paradise to us. Mother kept house, as the saying was. Hard water, cranky refrigeration, or chickens on the porch were just some of the minor challenges. Dad had an abiding interest in good farm practices. His care for our cows was shown when our herd was recognized as the highest producing herd in Illinois in 1939 and again in 1957. Since 1854, our great-grandparents, grandparents, and our mother and father had worked hard to make this farm a success. All the different farm animals, tools of all kinds, farm machinery, fields of corn, oats and hay, with all the different jobs unfolding as the seasons rolled around all were directed toward the end product of grade A milk. After milking was done, the cows would slowly walk into the deep oak woods and pastures. A willow line winding creek flowed through the pastures all the way to the east branch of the DuPage River. My brother and I always had a dam or two in progress with a swimming hole or ice skating pond, as did my daughters Heather and Miley and their friends and cousins, as they played all over the farm at a later time. Every farm around us raised hay, oats, sometimes winter wheat, but always the biggest fields seemed to be of corn. Most of our close neighbors, the Viles, Abbots, Fallhavers, Greens, Millers, all had dairy cows, as well as horses, pigs, chickens, turkeys, and ducks, all of which were fed corn. Our farm was only one of these many working farmsteads that surrounded the three small towns of Downers Grove, Lyle, and Naperville. Now all these farms are a part of an urban scene. Looking at these kernels of Indian corn reminds me of my father in 1937. Uh, he shelled a, a number of ears like this and took all the kernels and put them in the seed corn box of the corn planter and he planted the first dozen rows along 71st Street uh, with Indian corn mixed in with the seed corn. and. Uh, he explained to me that they were going to have a husking bee in the fall, a party. And I didn't really realize what that was until the fall rolled around. The frost hit our fields sometime in late September. The growing season had ended and the green corn stalks and leaves started to turn a golden brown as they dried. The husking bee party began one crisp October evening. The cows were all in the woods after an early milking when the first guests began to arrive rolling into our driveway, honking and calling out greetings to each other. They parked on the grass in a big circle around a pile of bonfire wood. All the guests brought dishes to pass and soon the hay rack was filled with homemade special dishes. 
Soon the huge harvest, silver golden moon, rose slowly in the eastern sky and flooded the scene in soft moonlight. The bonfire was roaring. The steaks were cooked by different men showing their caveman bonfire prowess. Everyone dug into the food. After a while, Warren Wells, a well-liked friend and prankster, jumped up and hollered out, Husking bee, husking bee, grab a sack. Everybody clapped, grabbed gunny sacks, and rushed off into the nearby cornfield. Soon, shouting and laughter came drifting out of the cornfield. Everyone seemed excited, with even more shouting and laughter. Little did I know that an ear of Indian corn was a ticket to have a free and unencumbered kiss with a person of their choosing. Not much of a reward, I thought, at my young age. Better a nice pocket knife or, you know, something useful. A part of our harvest every year in our farm was popcorn. Dad raised popcorn in our garden. But uh, I thought I've never even tried to uh, pop yellow dent corn. And I thought I might try that here just to see if we can get field corn to pop because maybe all these years we were missing the boat by not popping our just old regular field corn. I don't know if how many farmers have ever done this but I'm going to try it here. And we'll put in a little olive oil. Light the corn cobs. There we go, got a little bit of a fire so We'll give it a few turns and wait a minute and see if we can get some pop. Yellow, dense, field corn popping. It'll surprise me if it does, but it might. You, you can't ever really tell. There are always a lot of surprises when you get out to the country. You hardly ever know what farmers might do on a rainy day. Ooh, it's getting dark in there. Ooh. <laughs> wow. It's starting to pop. Not too many yet. Ooh, we'll see what we got. Wow. Okay. We'll try some of the yellow popcorn. We're pretty sure what's going to happen with that. Whoa! Well, there's quite a difference. There's quite a difference between field corn and popcorn. It's tastier and much more tender than the field corn, I'll tell you that. You've got to remember that the Native American peoples had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of variety of corn. Now, this is the corn that most of the farmers, our neighbors, and the corn that we raised. And it's called a yellow dent field corn. And it's called yellow dent because, you can see, the dents in the end of the kernels. The story of corn on our farm wouldn't be complete without describing the chinch bugs during widespread droughts of the 1930s. Millions of these smelly little black and white insects crawled into our fields of corn and grain. The corn and grain was devoured, leaving nothing to harvest. The bugs appeared like a moving carpet. Our father installed rain gutters at the edges of our cornfield along the path of invasion to funnel the bugs into big jars of poisonous creosote. This bug hell was soon overwhelmed by the millions of bugs. Here is what one of our neighbors, Mrs. Eichelberger, who lived over on College Road, remembers. We had three years of chinch bugs. Oh. 32 was when they started. We, oh, we had beautiful fields of and 30 of grain and the bugs come in and they just just you up you wonder how millions and millions and trillions and how far does it go and uh, well anyway chinch bugs were came in 20 to 30 
One of my earliest memories of corn on our farm were the times that Dad was out planting corn using the horse stepping method. From away across the fields, I could hear the corn planter clicking. Our two row planter was pulled by our two workhorses, Black Jack and Fanny. The planter was set to plant two rows of corn, 36 inches apart, and drop several kernels of seed corn every 36 inches. The pattern was accomplished by running a steel trip wire from one end of the field to the other end, with each end held in place by a 36 inch long iron stake. The wire was passed through the planter so that as the planter moved down the field, the steel knots on the trip wire would trip a lever, turn the corn plate, releasing three more kernels to drop into the planting shoe under the dirt. At the end of the row, Dad had to stop, take the wire off the planter, turn the horses and planter around, using the 36 inch long stake as a measuring rod, move the stake 36 inches and reset, and then reattach the wire, line up the horses on the planter mark 36 inches from the two rows he had just planted, and return down the field planting two more rows with the hills lining up with the rows and hills already planted. Earl Meisinger and Tom Kuhn talk about using this so-called horse step method of planting corn. It was raining and starting to rain and lightning struck at the other end and I had, I had, I was holding the stake ready to put it in the ground and it was grounded at the other end of the field and the lightning hit it. And uh, I remember it knocked me out and I didn't know where I was for a little while and finally I went home and I told my dad what happened and well he said I don't know what you can do but I said he said maybe go to go lay down and rest, he says, and forget about it for a day. And so by the next day I had a headache, but that was the end of it. Wow. Dad was a, a real stickler for having straight rows. <laughs> Dad, you used to get, he used to sit there and make them just as straight as could be there. And I'm sure you remember, you lived right down the road there. Yeah. Well, we lived down on 71st Street, down on Route 53. Okay. Mm -hmm. So... But I still remember my father getting out when they would uh, horse step it, and they had to put a wire at one end of the field on a stake. Right. And as the machine went along, it would go click, 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 mm -hmm. and put a seed in, and they have to keep changing it. Oh. And, th and then it cross cultivated in those days. Mm -hmm. You could cultivate both directions. Right. Then. And the first cultivation was easy, and the second one was <laughs> up and down. Auto. Yeah. Yeah, that was some. A lot of people say you'd get a lot more corn in a crooked row, but my dad was definitely the straight and narrow there. And he was Frank was planting corn at the Stafford farm, and it was like four, four thirty in the afternoon. So I sent someone to find him because our daughter uh, Mary Kay was on the way, and so he took me to the hospital. And with a half hour, I had the baby, and he came back and started planting corn again. <laughs> <laughs> See? Yep. We want to get that field finished. <laughs> That's a wonderful story. <laughs> and uh, did the baby do as well as the corn? Oh, absolutely. She did fine. The baby's now a kindergarten teacher. Yeah, in District 204. Oh, in District 204. <laughs> yeah. 
I found an old single row corn cultivator at the Sycamore Show. One row of corn at a time that goes right through these two plates here that protect it. And then these blades that you see down here dig up all the weeds. Now if the horses are just to one side or the other, you can actually steer this machine by pressing on these like this or like this and it moves the shovels so you don't cultivate out your corn. In the fall of 1946, just after the war, my father and I picked about 40 acres of corn by hand. We thought it was a big job. Not long ago, we discovered that our friend Paulie Miller, a longtime DuPage farmer, was in a corn picking contest out near Galesburg. So we went out to watch. Here's what we found. Two, one, begin, begin. This shows one of the oldest professions that farmers still engage in as they relive the hard good old days of picking corn by hand. We were surprised to find a bunch of old timers and young timers out in the sunny corn fields, showing a lot of stamina, working up a sweat, tossing ears against the old bang board. As a kid on our farm, it seemed to me that corn had been here forever, like all the other crops and animals. I slowly came to discover that farmers were central to a fantastic evolution in agricultural plants, animals, and farm practices. New information ideas came to us from everywhere. Every winter and early spring, seed catalogs, magazines, and salesmen would arrive touting new and improved Pioneer Fister decalb hybrid seed corns. Our old open pollinated corn seeds soon disappeared. Each year new and improved seeds, machinery, ideas, and improved farm practices came on the scene. Between hauling manure, milking, and making hay, our farm operation continued to evolve. Tired, 20 minutes is a long time for oh, me. you bet it is, you were working hard. <laughs> now I'll try my best. No, that's good. Yeah. Early mechanical corn pickers had very few safety devices on them. Uh, and many farmers were severely hurt when they attempted to untangle the corn stalks from the husking rollers. Elmer Staffel tells this story of what happened to him. This is uh, Elmer Staffel, who's been around 150 years farming here in Illinois. And he's uh, made hay and he's been a farmer. And that's how I know him. Elmer, let me have it. What, what's been going on in corn in your family all your life? All my life? <laughs> well, I know your life's not over yet. But I, I know we raise corn every year because we had dairy cattle, you know, and you had to have that corn to grind for your feed to feed the cattle and raise quite a few hogs all the time. Okay. So we raised quite a little corn. So. Wait, was this open pollinated corn back right. in those days? Back in them days, you picked it all by hand. And that if had to be you, if, pretty close to Indian corn. Right. If, if you get a bad storm, it would all go flat on the ground, and you'd walk along on your hands and knees picking corn all day. <laughs> okay. And yeah. in those days, you picked it by hand? Right, right. You didn't and, have no and corn And a pick. team of horses? Team of horses. You're right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you'd Sometimes go, you'd wear your rubber boots, and so, the mud was so deep, you'd practically go to the top of them. Okay. And you couldn't get a load on a wagon because the horses couldn't pull it. The ground was so soft. So okay. you put on what you could and go in and unload it. And then, uh, and then how did you go about unloading it? With a scoop shovel. You had your open corn cribs and you sh shovel it in there by hand. Okay. That was work. <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> Today farming is nothing. Okay. I hope Paulie ain't listened to that because he'd, <laughs> he'd say it's hard work. <laughs> yeah, it is hard work. Well, Elmer, tell us about the time you, uh, you were out in the field and whatever happened to you when I, you were picking corn. You I was a mechanical was, picker. I had a two-row corn picker, and uh, I was finishing up for the day. I pulled to the end, and me like a dummy, got off and didn't shut the tractor off. I left the corn picker run and I was cleaning it out. Cleaning it out. There was some ore stalks and ears in there, and I got my one finger caught in there, and in went my whole hand. <laughs> wow! <laughs> well, then what did you do? Well, the first thing I done, I braced myself so that I wouldn't go all the way all in with my arm and everything. 
And, and, then, and then the first thing I did, I reached in my pocket and got my pocket knife out, put it in my mouth and managed to open the blade up. And I got, took the trip rope. There was a rope on the back, a little rope there that you run the ears of corn of the chute, which would, you could shut off. And I took my knife and cut a, about a foot of rope off of there, put it in my mouth and cut it off. And then I tied it around my arm and I never lost no blood. And then I took my pocket knife and tried to cut this hand off because it was just hanging. Well, you were stuck. I was stuck, and I knew it was all mangled up. Yeah. And I tried to cut it off by the joint, right in uh -huh. the joint there. I didn't have no luck. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and just then, I was right for at the end of the road, the, by the road where this happened. Uh -huh. And uh, my neighbor come along there, Barney Barth his name was, and he stopped. And I told him, I said, go home and get a crowbar and come back. And we, he, but he, we, he, he shut the tractor yeah, off. Yeah, he shut the tractor off for me. Okay. And then he went home and got the bars, and we jammed them in there and broke the rollers, and I got my hand out. And by that time, the neighbor across the street, he, she, the lady called the paramedics out. And they, and they come out in the field there. They brought a doctor along and everything, and it was very nice of them. And, me, you know, I was an honorary old devil when I, they come out there with a the, with the stretcher and everything. Oh. And I says, get away. I don't need that thing. So <laughs> <laughs> the doctor didn't give me no shot or nothing. Oh, God. <laughs> and so I I walked over to the ambulance and crawled in, and they and dragged me up to the hospital. What, what year was this, Elmer? Oh, God. Uh -huh. Six, 68, I think, about. 68. Yeah. But ever since that time, then, then you had a... Uh, a mechanical I, hand I, put I, on I, it. I, oh, yeah, I had a, a hand, but I went in to get it in Chicago to get it, pick this hand up, and uh -huh. I wore it home, took it off, and threw it up in the closet, and it was there. I never wore it. You never I, wore it. I, I got me a hook, what they call a hook. That's on what I, there. yeah. And that I could lift anything yeah. with, you know, but and, that the hand, it was just like yeah. a lady's hand, you know. Yeah. And so that, that took care, well, that hook laid there for a good many years. And there was a fellow by the name of Louis Shuck. Uh -huh. he, had, he had lost his hand to it. And he says to me, he says, will you sell me that hook? Or the hand, the hand he okay. won. I said, you can have it. I, 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 gave it to, I gave it to him, and he buried it out in the Naperville Cemetery. So that's Did he the, really? That's the story. So you're half buried. So that's the story. I got no more hand. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, my. I think that's the end of the story. Well, uh, <laughs> it, uh, but, but that didn't slow you down from farming because no, I, no, uh, no, I, all these past years, I know you and Ronnie Bergell have been making making hay, hay I, tons and right I, the, with that hook i could with a hook you could handle yeah. them bales then you need a, didn't need a hay hook right 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 yeah. yeah so well you're not the only guy that's ever had an accident on no, a farm so but, uh, it it when you stop and think of it it's just carelessness yeah. that's all yeah oh, okay. boy. <laughs> well well i tell you losing a hand and putting everything together i think i've done fairly good in my days you did great right Darn right. Elmer. I farmed for quite a few years. How, with many, a, how many years did you farm total? To, well, I was I was farming ever since I was about 16 years old. You've been farming about 74 years if you started at 16. For, for myself, yeah. Yeah. And I'm not retired yet, you see. Yeah. I go out to Waterman to my daughter out there and son-in-law and help them. Okay. I drive the big tractor ahead, ahead and he, driving the tractor he, fo he follows up planting. Right. So right. I still consider I'm farming yet. <laughs> you are. Good for you, Elmer. <laughs> well, they tell me I'm one of the oldest farmers in DuPage County, still active in farming, that is still living. You, you must be, yeah. My next birthday, I'm going to be 90. 90, 90. 90, 90. 90. If I make it that long, God. so. <laughs> well, God bless you, Elmer. Oh. <laughs> You're one hell of a guy. About 1943, during the Second World War, I learned more about corn when I worked for a couple of weeks detasseling corn. We were high school age kids riding a field rig carried by one tractor. We stood on planks carried by the rig so that we were shoulder high to the corn tassels. Our job was to pull the tassels out of the stalk, drop them on the ground, and not miss any. We learned that the two rows of corn of a different variety were left with their tassels to produce the pollen to fertilize the eight or ten rows of corn we had de-